How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? All right. It's great to meet you. And before we get started, you know, we had some scheduling problems and uh, I always mess up when I'm dealing with people from uh, different time zones. Uh, how many how many time zones are there in the in the United States? Oh, shit. You didn't say there was going to be a quiz. It's not a quiz. Like, uh, I'm actually I'm actually curious. I'm OK. Central Pacific Eastern Mountain. I assume Alaska probably has one. I'm going to say at least four or five. Wait, because there's a... I, I I always thought there was three, to be honest with you. Because I think you there's know, three. When it, well, there should be. It's, I think it's, it might only well, be three. I don't know. But, but it's real because, you know, you watch commercials. The, the commercials on TV come on uh, for, for a show. It's uh, this time, Eastern uh, Central Eastern Pacific. Uh, yeah. But I was like... Pacific seems like a large time zone because I know I can see how if you look at map of the United States, you see Eastern and uh, like East, like Eastern and Central are close together. But the entire Midwest and the and the coast is like that's that's a huge time zone. Like I'm is there only three? I think I mean, is mountain time? There's mountain time, but I don't know if that's the same. As I actually never heard of mountain time. Am I making mountain time up? We have Google for this. This is why we have this. Here, oh man. Let me ask the internet. This is, I mean, we're we're talking over the internet about things we can look up on the internet. Let me ask. How many time zones in US, just in case people are keeping like a score? Okay. Oh my God. Are you ready for this? How many? Are what did we say? You said you said there were three. I said there were. Five, I thought there maybe. were three. I, I thought there were three, but I, I'm, th I'm assuming there might be four. Are you ready? The I official mean, answer, according to Wikipedia, is that there are nine. Is it, is it counting Hawaii and like territorial ground and Puerto Rico? Well, yes, we have. Good. Okay, here we go. Pacific time. See, I'm so, I'm, just that's the, how, okay. That's mountain how selfish time, I am. Mountain time does exist and shocker. It's over the mountains. Central time is huge. Then you've got, so you've got Pacific Mountain, Central Eastern, then absolutely correct how Hawaii and Alaska have. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's only six, but they said there were not. Maybe they count it when you, cause like not every place observes daylight savings time. That's, I'm such an right? arrogant, I'm, I'm such an arrogant American. When I'm talking about time, I'm thinking like just the body from California to Florida and Maine. I'm just that, thinking of the main that's body. Called, that, that, that's the main body. The, the continental United States is usually what that's referred to. I don't know. Here's the good news. Um, here's how I do it. I have my weather app on my iPhone and I have all the cities that people live in because right above the temperature, it tells you what time it is there. Mm. So if I'm ever actually in doubt or can't do the math or can't remember if it's forward or back, I look at the weather app and go, it's 3.57 in Chicago. That's all I need to do. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had guests from, from, from both sides, of, both, both coasts, and I, I've really, uh, this isn't the first time I messed up uh, scheduling. What, right. would, did, what did we mess up? Am I late? Are you late? No, what no, no. Um, no, what I messed up was um, before I used to mess up the hour, I, I would like get on like, I had this uh this woman from Atlanta on on the podcast and I was like uh, are we are we one hour one hour apart or two or are you ahead well, you or guys behind are both central. I, no 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 Atlanta is is uh is uh, eastern east so I was like I'm on an hour uh before we're supposed to start I was like are you an hour ahead or an hour behind I'm an hour. I, I it just confuses me talking about it. So, like, <laughs> I think you'll have it all worked out by the time you don't have to but think what about I, it anymore. What, you'll have it all. But worked scheduling out. this this episode, what I messed up is uh, the uh, the date because uh, you know the storm hit hit us and like I lost track of what I, I lost tra lost track of what day it is. So you guys, you were totally I, frozen. Tell me, tell me about how the storm hit you. Well, well, what I want, what what I tried to do, like, remember when I talked to you. 
uh, I wanted to schedule this for, 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 for today, but I thought today was last Tuesday, the 23rd. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah. Um, ever since the storm here, I, I've been lost and like, they're actually, I'm in my house, uh, like in the house I'm renting here while I'm going to college. They're actually repiping the whole house as we speak, as we're speaking right now. You're lucky. I imagine they're in high demand and hard to get right now. Yeah, it's because um, this this is a really uh, like I'm really hoping that that um, nothing happens, like a like a pipe bursts through the through the ceiling or something, and we have to call yeah. this off early. I like, hope I kind of hope not too, and but full disclosure that I a little bit I kind of hope for it a little bit. It'd be kind of interesting <laughs> to watch a little bit. I don't actually want it to happen, but. Similarly, I have a sleeping baby in the next room, so I'm hoping she doesn't wake up too. We we all have our hopes, our hopes and our dreams. This this podcast is running on on a, on a tightrope. Anything could end it right now. It's like a I Tyson fight. Fact, see, the fact that we met at the at the right time is amazing. Yeah, I don't have I that mean, type we nailed, of luck. We nailed the first challenge. We nailed it. We nailed it. Yeah, and like another. Like and to believe, like people in Texas, uh, we put people in power that don't believe in the science. A storm, an ice storm, just hit Texas. That that where the house is actually collapsed. That because they weren't prepared for it. I was like, so as of right now, because it's March second. I just got uh, speaking of your fine state. That as of today, they've lifted everything. No mask mandate. Uh, Abbott said it's a hundred percent open. Yeah, it's okay? um, you guys doing okay? I'm really, I'm really uh, kind of annoyed from that because I have sure, I have at uh, uh, my father's an at risk, you know. Uh, mm. Like my dad's an old Mexican man. He has like the top three killers of <laughs> of, of minority men, like the diabetes, oh. high blood pressure, uh, all that. And like, I think he already got his vaccine. I need, I need. I think he told me he already got his vaccine, but but you know it's very concerning and like what 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 abbott uh what abbott uh tried to say is like texas need to go back to work they need to pay their bills why like why what about the bill collectors what about them like who's making money out of at the end of this i i know there's like some uh uh what, what's that uh i know there's like some scrooge mcduck motherfucker somewhere in his in, in his in his huge couch reading reading the paper still uh, making money while while we're trying to make a way to find find a way to pay pay this rent, and sure. like it's frustrating. It's like the makes you wonder. Yeah, yeah, it's tough, man. Well, hopefully, y'all can the vaccines can keep up with the law, the ambitious uh, uh, opening. I mean, here in LA, who knows? Well, who knows? We could be wearing masks for the rest of our lives. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. And uh, what was it? I forgot what I was about to say, but I think it's uh, wearing them. I used to work at a fast food. I, I worked at Wingstop at, at a wing place. And, and the things that I've seen, bro, it like, I think everyone should understand if you eaten fast food since March, you probably tested positive at some point during that area. <laughs> there is no way, there is no way you 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 made it without without ever getting sick. It's like it, it virtually impossible. It's hard. It's impossible to keep those places clean. That's why. Yeah, I, I, I never I never worked fast food. I worked in a restaurant, but I never worked fast food. But even in a sit down like fine dining restaurant. Once you went through the swinging doors of the kitchen, it was like, ugh. Everything, everything's greasy in, in the kitchen. Like, I, you know what? I got to be honest. The place I worked wasn't that bad. I worked at a McCormick and Schmick's seafood place. Do you have those? Um, nah. And it was like, you would think a seafood place, the kitchen would be pretty nasty, but it was actually really nice. The manager was uh, a dick, but the food was really good. Yeah, I left, I left for, for many reasons. Like I can't work in fast. Like this is the last straw. I've worked in fast in in in, in, in restaurants before. I don't want to work in food anymore. It, it, this was like the last straw. It's just 
um you know uh, people religious religious people talk about you know like well what, what's the biggest sin uh threatening the country it's not it's not gay marriage it's not any any of that it's i think it's greed and gluttony and that's what really really like pisses, pisses me off like i remember I, i'm just making french I, i'm just cooking in the back and watching people walk in just like angers me knowing that like I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Like what? What? What's your uh, like? Re- like what's your races? But like I'm. I'm. I'm full on Latina. We believe. We. I'm not a very superstitious person, but we believe in this thing called the eye. Uh, it's basically uh, we, ojo. Basically, basically the superstition is uh, if someone gives you a dirty look, it cripples your soul. Uh, I did not believe that until I uh, until I was like a until recently, because every time I, I was work cooking in the back. And let's say the cashier was busy doing something else. People walk in, walk into the restaurant, look at me, and just I I could feel it burning, burning the side of my face while I'm trying to trying to keep it because I'm not at the cashier. I'm I'm just supposed to, I'm not the cashier. And while they're they're just staring, I could feel them staring at me. And like I I I, I develop a an anger problem because of it. I was like, from now on, people have three chances. To, to and and if they're still looking at me, I'm gonna just go off. It's like I'm I'm not a I'm not an aggressive person, but like it, it really got to me <laughs> so recently. You do not like being looked at. Um, it it used to it used to not be. I'm not a tough kid. I'm not I'm not tough at all. It's just I'm not very angry. But it's some about people who who can't cook for themselves and <laughs> walking in and get and giving you a dirty look while you're trying just trying to do your job so you, well, okay so you don't think that people you think the people that go out to eat at fast food can't cook for themselves most of them yeah i was like that's fair i worked at a shipley's before this i worked at a donut place before this the place i i used to close it closes at eight o'clock you 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 would wonder like who would go to a donut place at sometime that's not in the mornings who will go to a donut place in the afternoon i had to deal with those people that that walked in and i was like and like at the donut place like every it was every hour or so like like from like from 12 to to eight o'clock when we closed probably about seven people walked in by if i had the average but those people really will get on your nerves it's (laughs) i think the bane of a like where you society peaked and has been going downhill ever since there is ever since they created that uh the customer is always right policy i think mm-hmm. that's where we we've been going downhill ever since i think like i think that happened the same way where reality tv came into and came into play where reality reality tv started to get big and customers always right 100 percent customer satisfaction and american society just been plummeting down ever since and that's a fair observation. I think that's fair. And I've worked enough customer service to know that the customer is rarely right. Yeah. And speaking of like, and, and to get into, in, into the comedy, you know, I, I preached about this, you know, one, two, uh, my top three comedians, my top three comedians of all time, Bill Hicks, uh, Bill Burr, and Patrice O'Neill. Patrice O'Neill has had the, the biggest influence in my life period uh, uh whether it be relationships uh dating how how i handle interact with people i remember i was working at at wing uh working at, at this wing place because i don't know if they pay for advertising i uh, working at this wing place <laughs> one uh this woman came in we had her order ready because she put in an order everything was right but she waited so long checking everything that she wanted that by the time she like double checking everything. Are the fries well done? Is the is it is the right kind of seasoning on? Is there is it there no sauce on? It, it, like, can I get extra? Ran- she she basically was milking the clock. She was milk mil- milking it, taking just taking her time on purpose. And by the time she sat down to eat, he was like, "I want my money back. My food is cold." <laughs> and the and like the anger that that was building inside me 
for 30 minutes we were uh, after after the after this woman came come came back to us we were like arguing trying to get her money back because you know it's it's no it's not easy trying to give get a refund uh, give a refund especially for fast food and i was like the the thing that popped into my head during this whole ordeal you know i have anxiety i was like i had wristbands i was really pulling them and snapping them and i was like what would patrice do in this situation <laughs> and i was like i i i checked and I, I was i put my hands in my pocket and i felt i have a 20 dollar bill in my pocket just in my i had it between i was twirling it in my fingers while while my hand was in my pocket i was like if i was patrice o'neill i would give this lady a 20 and say here's your money i don't want to deal with you i'd rather not make rent than to fully look this through with you Please leave, leave us alone, man. <laughs> and the doc, the documentary came out. I don't know if you've seen it out. The Patrice O'Neill documentary came out. I, uh -huh. I haven't seen it yet, but I saw a clip on YouTube. And there was this cl clip of Patrice at a show where he pulled money out of his pocket and gave it to a heckler or a late uh, or uh, to a lady at, uh, telling her to leave his show because you're not you're not enjoying the show. And it it just hit me in, in my heart as soon as I saw that and reminded me like, oh my God, this is like, this, this dude really hit, uh, really hit, hit me. He's really, he's embedded in my brain. I, I, it's just, his, his aura is, is it burning into my skull, it's in my spirit. I, I just... And it, to me, it's like a sign, like maybe, maybe, like maybe, maybe this is, this guy made me who I am. And sure. like, it's just a surreal experience that I, it, that I had. Imagine being I, I such a bad heckler that you get paid to leave. <laughs> that would be just, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It'd be the best of times and the worst of times. All right, man. Well, that was a great, great intro to start off this this episode. <laughs> All right. So basically, this this part, I, lo I love that. By the way, I gotta say, I love that guitar you have back back there. Oh, thank you, thank you. It's. I promise I won't play it. It's um. No, it's cool. It. You know. <laughs> no, nah, this this podcast is like uh the way the the best way to describe the podcast is like a uh uh the real life Wayne's world. That's why I got oh, my own right here. I already put my initials. Hey, yep. look at that. Right it's on. like, you know, I, I, I was watching Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, I, I just discovered Stevie Ray Vaughan, and it's like, oh. and I was like, and I saw the guitar he was using. It's like this Stratocaster, this color scheme, but his was all scratched up and scraped. And I was like, like damn. Yeah, like, like road worn. Yeah, it's like. It's a great. I gave my guitar a name, and like, uh, this these are my initials up top. I gave this this name to my guitar, Atsi. Atsi. Yeah, it's that's great. You know, and I'm not super. Like I said, I'm not very superstitious, but Atsi is like an Aztec name, which means rain. And the weather's been pretty crazy ever since I named my guitar Atsi. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should have named it Thor. Ah, oh, man. Thor, that's not... I think that's more... Is that Greek mythology? Greek? Roman? Roman? Uh, Greek? I don't know. You know, Where's, talking about time zones Chris now, now Greek... <laughs> <laughs> talking about time zones now, and now we're talking about, like, mythology. mythology. Yeah, yeah we, we, we should have paid attention in school. So are you are you guys out of the deep freeze now? What's how's the weather in Houston now? Are you guys feeling it's all right? It's hot. It's hot. It's seventy degrees. Humid. It's Crazy. back to normal. Yeah. Yeah. Is uh Houston weather is is the bi bi bipolar girlfriend of the United States. It's, <laughs> we have the like the like two the two only things that that suck about Houston. I love I love the city of Houston, but. The two two worst attributes of Houston is uh the weather and the uh and the traffic. And that's mm -hmm. the only reason you should have moved here. Other than that, it's a pretty good place to be in here. Nice. Yeah. What 
oh man like what i missed out on is the the comedy scene that 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 took place here in houston it's like i i hear stories that 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 you know when i when i listen to someone like ron white speak or like who used to like tour tear it up in houston like uh bill hicks sam kinnison the entire texas outlaw it was, it was like and this it all just went away it's dead it's dead it's maybe depressing. it'll be reborn maybe you'll re you know there's a lot of stuff that's that's poised to be reborn right now maybe that's you you said you said you're going to college there i'm in uh i'm in a small town like an hour away from uh -huh. houston yeah uh -huh. going to blink college start it start something start a stage things god knows things are open now <laughs> you can do it i'm not right? i'm not i haven't been invited back to the open mic uh that that i that i started at is uh, this... you have to be invited to an open mic i thought yeah they I, open they're open you know what? I think that's I think that's why I died. You have to email them. You have to email them Thursday. They'll get back to you on Sunday. Monday is the Monday night is the show, is, is the show for open mic. And it's like uh, this is the sh this, I think this is why it's dead. Uh, sure. Well, you should start it. Start something up. You got a microphone. Put a put a you know couple of ring lights out. Set up some chairs. Start your own open mic. Yeah. Especially in Texas, they let you do anything. Especially. Yeah. Listen, they even yeah. let you do that kind of stuff here in LA, where we don't let you do anything. <laughs> and anyone can have an open mic in LA. They they let us do everything but 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 do drugs. That's basically Texas for you. Oh, we have lots of drugs here. You can do all the drugs here. Like like I have this. I have this, I, I joke about this. Uh, you give you know. Uh, I I didn't grow up in the hood. I grew up in the in the suburbs, but on the border of the hood, I could see the hood from my house way back. Uh, my, I lived in the neighborhood where, where, where young cats, oh, who made it out the hood moved to. And I was like, and you, you think the hoods and the hoods in LA and LA or New York are dangerous. Imagine a hood with Texas gun laws is like, is <laughs> just world is just dangerous to be a part. <laughs> are they going to legalize? marijuana in texas you think uh not while well, while well, no not during not not anytime I mean, soon is north the dakotas did it they're and we only I need one of them texas will. i think texas will i think tech there's too much money to be made yeah but it's not the right people making the money that's the problem but that but it is but it will you know it is everyone i mean I mean, there is California has done a good job, I think, of like going back and expunging criminal records for marijuana use. They've tried to kind of and giving get, allowing uh, people whose only record involved marijuana are now sort of prohibited from starting businesses for the legitimate marijuana market. And I think that they've been kind of trying to like go back and, and allow yeah. folks to to make money on their skill set now that you know it's legal but i heard the biggest problem in 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 la specifically is like the homelessness is is getting out of hand the homeless problem i moved here in 2014 um and was always really shocked by the homelessness because i'm from the i'm originally from wisconsin and then lived in minneapolis and st paul for a long time there's unhoused people there too, um, but significantly less because our winters are, you cannot survive on the street. Um, and we have some shelter. I mean, there is, a, like I said, an unhoused population, but it's smaller and it's more fluid. In LA, I, it was the first time I lived somewhere where you see sort of semi-permanent, um, long, long-term, you know, established sort of, build. I mean, it, it, Skid Row is, you, it's hard to really understand it until you see it. It's heartbreaking. I hear the, I hear the, I hear the biggest issue is I heard Bill Maher talk talk about this is that everyone is trying to get their beak wet into this market. Like to make a house is so expensive because there has to be so many people involved to make some type of profit. And I think that's what's really holding it back. I heard it costs like 
half a million for porta parties or something like that. Some some ridiculous number for for porta parties, and that's why the homelessness problem is not getting any better. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know specifically about porta potties, but there's a lot of factors. I mean, for example, there's not there's not enough affordable housing. I mean, everything is super, super expensive. It's very easy for someone who in almost every any other city might be able to sort of pull it together to lose a home just because of how expensive rent is here. And um, there's not enough affordable housing to go around. So even if you have the money, but just have a certain budget, you know what I mean? It's hard to even find anything that's in your... Um, in your budget and they there's there's it's really complicated and then when they want another issue is that when they do the city does get approval for like a shelter or low-income housing and like a really great location the people who live around the area that they propose to build these things object and say we don't want it in our neighborhood they think it'll bring you know crime and disease and they don't like the way it looks and so often it is middle class people who are sort of barely holding on that are so afraid of what the solutions would do to them that they strike down any chance at sort of fixing things because they just don't want it and then it you know so it just keeps getting moved around and declined or underfunded underfunded or whatever. if you had to get if you had to guess what would be like a like the average you know cheap rent like someone looking for to find find an apart a small apartment a studio apartment like what would what would be that the at like the cheapest that would be like 800 um it depends if you if you it depends i have not heard of anyone who has a, a rent under 12 1500 dollars a month i think and i mean certainly if you're not sharing a bedroom like if you have a lot of roommates you know, you can probably make it work like if, if for folks who are able to share a room or to, you know, kind of stretch it, I think you could get under a thousand dollars a month. Um, but that's pretty tough. Like I lived in a trail, I moved to LA in an RV and lived in an RV park for the first almost four years I was here. And it was almost, it was over a thousand dollars a month to park an RV in, a, in an RV park. What? <laughs> Yeah, a thousand dollars for for a parking space. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, oh it my. gave you water. It was where you plugged into your water and your power, and there was a bathrooms and garbage. I'm paying. The gym. I mean, it's. A, yeah. I'm in college. I'm not dorming because that, that's that whole thing is a scam. I'm not dorming at at at, at the college. I'm I'm in the house down to like just a block away from the college, and I'm paying four hundred a month. All bills all bills paid. Every, every like. Everything for the for this small room that that's one wall. This is one wall, but it, I make do. Yeah. But in mm -hmm. here, you know, Texas A and M in College Station. College Station has like the cheapest rent. Like I don't know if the ground is falling in College Station. It's just like unbelievably cheap. How like there's college kids who not even going to college are getting minimum wage jobs and paying like three hundred some rent in like. For 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 a studio apartment, it was like, like the, uh, that's that's a way to live life, in my opinion. That's like I can have a job, find a and, and meanwhile finding finding a career. I was like, whatever. But like, and that's not the you know there. But like, all right, that's. Basically, basically, so basically what we're trying to get at is like te te the differences between Texas and California. It's yeah. It's, well, a lot of people, I mean, it's the, a lot of people are moving, you know, they, every, there's, oh, I feel like I hear every once in a while, pretty regularly that there's a big statistic of people fleeing. They all usually use where it's fleeing California's expensive, you know, life to go to Texas. And, and I get it. I mean, I, I, like I said, I'm from the Midwest where stuff is a lot cheaper and there is a lot of sticker shock here. The trade-off, though, has always been the same. The, the, that LA has, theoretically, depending on who you are, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of opportunity. More opportunities in virtually every field, especially the arts, especially comedy, especially entertainment. 
Um, you can just work here in ways you can't work anywhere else. I don't know how long that's going to be true. Maybe forever. But now that, you know, there's a there's a lot of film and television that is established in other cities. You know, you can do Zoom. People are able to shoot stuff outside of the net, outside of the studios and stuff like that. But I mean, and the weather is perfect all the time. I can tell, certainly coming from the Midwest and living here for the last six years, six, seven years, I'm telling you there's, the weather's incredible. And, you know, you can go snowboarding in the morning and surfing at night. <laughs> You know, in in LA, are you you're, you're you're familiar with the 405? I am. I can almost how, see it. Yes. <laughs> how bad? How bad? How bad does it get? How bad does it get? It totally depends. Now with the pandemic, it, there is no traffic in LA anymore. <laughs> I mean, well, I'm, I'm imagine, overstating it. I'm overstating it. But like I used to, it used to be. I'll get, when when I say it depends, because here's an example. I, my day job before the pandemic, one of my jobs was uh, as a entertainer at Universal Studios Hollywood. And I lived in this trailer park in Van Nuys and Van Nuys is like a suburb, it's in the valley. With no traffic, it would take about 20 minutes to get from my house to Universal Studios. But it was not unusual for it to take over an hour. If like, I had to get there between the hours of eight and ten in the morning, or like that, Thursday. like take the the worst, uh, the four or five at its worst time of the day. Mm -hmm. That's every road in Houston, <laughs> all yeah, the time, dude. It's every road in Austin. It's every road in the twin the Minneapolis, St. Paul. The population has grown faster than the infrastructure, and traffic is always terrible. I was told when I moved to LA, homelessness and traffic. These are going to be the things that you're going to have to deal with and the fact is that that is only conditionally true the city uh moves the unhoused people around they're not everywhere it's it, it, tragically frankly they're not everywhere they're sort of clustered do you know what i mean there's like areas in which unhoused people sort of congregate and tend to live and they they move them around it's very difficult but if you live in certain areas, yeah, you're surrounded by unhoused people all the time. Traffic here sucks, but only at certain times a day on certain routes. And because this city was invented after cars, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, like the Minneapolis, St. Paul, maybe even Houston were cities that had horses and wagons, right? They were, there were really permanent buildings that were built for rivers and like, you for know, roads with horses and buggies. California did not have big cities until after cars. You know, this city was know. really populated after 1940. So they built the city with highways and roads and room for parking and all of this stuff. The city was built with cars in mind. So it really moves them around rather well. You know, you know what's a big trip? Uh, people from like New York or, uh, or the East Coast saying, they talk of if they talk about like yeah, like here in here in Houston or in L. A. I heard someone say about Houston. I don't like uh, from New York. He said I don't like Houston because you have to have a car to go everywhere. I was like, you don't. Of course, you need a car to go everywhere. I was like, like New York, and I, I know. until I realized that the in in New York they take trains and cars. How many people like? I don't know what the percentage is, but it has to be huge. The percentage of people who don't own the car who live like in in, in New York. Yeah. In, in Manhattan. Well, I think like, that, it's like... and it's too bad, man, because my understanding is that the subway system in New York is incredible. It's, you know, built in you know, probably the twenties is my guess, thirties. I don't know, but they haven't kept it up. I mean, the problem is it used to be that way. Now they haven't fixed the subway. They haven't expanded things. They haven't done other things. So it's really run down. It's very crowded. It's hard for it to run on schedule. So more and more people have to figure out something else. Remember when the when the pandemic first broke out and news came out that the New York subways are being cleaned for the first time in 120 some years? Yeah. Like, and that yeah. really confused me because when I did the math, it's like I didn't even know a subway would have existed back then. It was like yeah, what? I'd be 1890s. We, we can look that up too. I bet my guess my guess is that it's. 1890s would be the earliest probably not until the early 90s like 1920s is my guess 
Is a pipe about to burst over your head? No, I'm smelling asbestos and I'm I'm feeling dizzy. But <laughs> I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm I'm messing with you. Uh, All right, if you go down, I'll just I'll keep I'll keep going. I'll fill the hour. Don't panic. <laughs> All right. So, so where where are you originally from? Like, where were you born? Um, I was born in Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin, which is a tiny little town right in the very center of Wisconsin. Um, it's a if you've heard of, you know, Milwaukee, Madison are the biggest cities and those are hours, two hours away, two and a half hours away from my town. All right. And like, like, uh, how, like two, two questions, how long have you been doing comedy and like, where did it all start for you? Mm. Well, I, that's a, that's a good question. Technically, I would say I started doing comedy in high school because I was on, I started doing improv and I was like on, you know, the, the high school like improv uh, team and doing comedy. And that was sort of when I started and I was performing and stuff. I went to college at the University of Minnesota um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I did theater and comedy there, but not stand up. I didn't do, and then I, I made my living for a long time hosting shows and emceeing game shows. And I, I ran a variety show, like live uh, kind of comedy forward variety shows, sketches, improv, that kind of stuff. But I didn't do stand up proper until I moved to Los Angeles. And my first gig was 2015. So six, six years ago that I started doing professional stand up comedy but a lot longer ago that I started doing performative comedy. All right, so you've always been like in, in, in the game, but like you started doing specifically stand-up uh, six years ago? Yeah, yeah, because you know, the difference is like, uh, do you do improv or any other kind of- uh, No, I'm like- Comedy, performing? Um, last time I took like a, a theater arts class was sixth grade. Uh, and that was the last, there was never like, you know, I was like, I really hated it because the teacher, I want, I really wanted to punch this teacher in the face. I, re I remember mm -hmm. his name to this day. I mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure he was a good guy, but like, it's just, I don't think it made it, it, it like, basically he was, a, he was this cliche theater teacher, long hair, beard, you know, black so turtleneck. Mm hmm black suit wore, actually wore a lot of black turtlenecks yeah that leather leather patches no like like the black the like the black three-piece but without the tie and oh. sneak and and like black uh uh non-slip non -slip shoes with the suit <laughs> that and this was you said this was sixth grade this Shirt. this was sixth grade Shirt. and well this never happened again but the end of, towards the end of sixth grade this was there was this there, there was a variety show and i wanted to do stand-up when in mm -hmm. sixth grade i wanted to do like mm, i could do i could I, like i think i could do stand-up i i auditioned i like so I, I auditioned i went in front of these three white ladies that that had like little understanding of what i was saying and i didn't i didn't make it so that i think about it uh i completely bombed that time so <laughs> i guess i could technically say i started doing comedy in sixth grade but do you remember I didn't... any of the jokes that you told? Uh, I, I think I do, but like some of it, I have an active like I have a like ADHD. Like if I if I start daydreaming, I really get like hip, it, it go into trance and forget. And like I can't tell you what will be, like memories that. I recreated or, or what actually happened. So I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I sucked if to yeah. all truth be told, mm -hmm. but, but I guess you could technically, I could technically say I started doing comedy sixth grade, but I didn't, I started doing stand up like a couple months ago, going to, to, to that open mic you had to sign up for that yeah, that's really, hard. yeah. But <sighs> what are you majoring in in college? Or what is I'm measuring. I'm major. I'm majoring in architecture. Um, you know, but that's most like the uh, most likely the thing. I hope my mom doesn't see this. That's most likely the thing that I just tell my parents so they don't worry. I mean, uh, I love. I love. They don't like the idea of stand up as a career for you. No, like that's like the 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 stripper for guys. 
uh, telling your parents you've had to do stand up. <laughs> like, yeah, I want to. Oh, I want to go make. So proud. I want. I want to go make dick jokes on stage while. <laughs> for uh, i'm uh, like i'll do it for free for a while but sure <laughs> like oh my god <laughs> but oh yeah well i mean my understanding is that the money for comedy you know you have to tour it's about sort of being able to get a big you know fan base and then sell tickets yeah i've you know i have that cliche young comic uh I make the those rookie mistakes basically, you know. Um I have probably a reason why I don't go back is because I'm too filthy, I'm too dark. Uh I really the this face you don't you don't expect to see this face and talk about uh to, to come on stage and say and talk about suicide jokes or, or whatever. But it's honestly like and that's one thing I want I want wanted to bring up, like how like the importance of like your image, like your image, when you go up on stage, like how you look and how your comedy is present, presented, like, like, just, can you like imagine? Like, I was watching Sam Kinison this morning, like, all right, Sam Kinison is hilarious because he's Sam Kinison, and then you got someone like uh, John Mulaney, uh, uh, a, 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 a dude doing it today. What would happen if like Sam uh, John Mulaney starts to act like completely just like Sam Kinison? Like, what if he go, what if, like, the John Mulaney, you know, goes, why buy the cow when you could get to, to just screaming <laughs> into the mic? Yeah. It's, and you see his, like, little feminine body just run around, uh, run around on stage saying, saying, all right, I need so I need a guy with a, with a heartbreak story to come down here and memorize the phone number. We're going to call the, because Sam Kinson used to actually do that, uh, have someone from the audience call up one of their exes. And, and and they're on stage in front of in front of uh, thousands of people. Re- uh, this is to be released at home, and and there's like calling calling a girl a, a woman to cut a cut on, on the phone, not knowing that she's about to be on HBO. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so with, with, like what that tells me, like like how important is that 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 the way you you look and the image you perceive is like important to like to bring into consideration on stage that's a i think it's a really good question i would say that especially when you bring up two people so different like sam kinnison and john mulaney that what it tells you isn't it it isn't so much about what your look is i think it's about authenticity and a little bit of heightening you know what i mean like who you actually are i feel like they're the best bullshit sniffers it's not exactly the phrase i wanted to use the bullshit meters the 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 people who who seem to see through bullshit the best are kids and stand-up comedy audiences and i don't mean bullshit like you can say for example like as a comic sometimes the joke you know my my mom told me yesterday that blah 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 and it wasn't your mom it was your friend, you know, yes, this happened, but it wasn't to you, it was to your friend. But for the sake of the joke, you're gonna say it's you. I don't mean that kind of bullshit because that's artistry, that's crafting a good joke. I mean, actual bullshit, like just not being your authentic self. Because John Mulaney, I, I've, I've not met him personally, but I have some kind of approximate, is, is that guy. That's not an act. He doesn't come off stage and be anyone else. Almost to a fault, you know, Robin Williams was sort of famously, certainly in the early days, difficult to hang out with because he wasn't that much different off stage than he was on stage. Can you still hear me? I think my earbuds might have. Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. So, you know, he was just a really difficult person to be around because he was so kinetic and crazy and hard, you know, but that was what the audience liked, you know, or even like the, the blue collar guys, you know, the, I forget his name, Ron White, you know, who has the, the scotch and all that stuff. Like that's heightened. Meaning I know that guy loves smoking cigars, drinking scotch and being kind of a backroom guys guy. That is who he is. That he's turning it up a little bit, shining a light on it and maybe letting him be even more himself on stage. But I don't think it, for me, 
when I see real characters, like a caricature, like a performance, a comedian that's pretending, it's very rarely works. Like the, the exception for me is like um, um, Andy Kaufman. You know, Andy Kaufman yeah. could play a character and, or, you know, like Sasha Baron Cohen can, can pretend, completely pretend and perform to be someone else. But that still works, I think, because if you were best friends with Sasha Baron Cohen or Andy Kaufman, they probably slip in and out of characters like that all the time. Being a different character is authentic to them. Do you know what I mean? But if you, yeah. if, if I, for example, decided that I wanted to start doing stand up a bit where I screamed all the time, like Sam Kennison, it would never ever be as funny because it's just not real. Where I don't have any doubt in my mind that if you invited Sam Kennison to a party, and he was telling you a story that he would scream at you part of that story. <laughs> you know well, I mean? getting, well, if you invite Sam Kinison to a party, you're getting fucked up and no one, no one, you're not remembering that night. But see, then sometimes I think people get trapped in it because like, apparently that's what it was for like folks like Belushi, um, you know, who was the party guy and, or uh, Farley, Chris Farley, right? These like- I was just watching it. I was, I was just watching him that we like, they, they were probably really fun partiers who loved drugs and loved to ha hang out with people, but then they sort of got trapped in this box where they were so expected to be crazy and stoned all the time that it was like nobody wanted anyone other than that guy. Do you know well, what I one mean? Thing I, yeah, nobody one thing I want- Tea with Chris Farley, you know? Yeah. One thing I want to is like to keep my authenticity into in, in, in some type of control, if that makes sense, because and like, I learn. Uh, I I do a lot of reflecting while watching comedy. And when I was watching Joey Diaz one time, I was like, uh, I had an epiphany. It was like, to to like, I'm just I, inside. I just feel like a ball ball of energy, and it's not all. And, it, and it's not all good. It's I have so much, like, anxiety, and and just like anxiety, depression, angst, and excitement all balled, balled into a ball that sometimes I feel like I just want to put myself in a stray jacket and just like roll around and scream for, for about an hour. Or, and like to go inside, inside my head, like, what can I do? Like to go inside my head, like I, I could write like pretty, uh, like, like some pretty good jokes, but, but if to, to, to like be like for like like me to look like me be baby face and for this stuff to come out of your mouth and like i have like like i said rookie mistakes i like you know dick jokes politics uh, uh satire oh my oh my god i'm gonna be the next bill hicks like i'm a uh i'm gonna i'm gonna nail this and like and for it to not 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 happen i was like 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 how can i keep my authenticity to a under control to a point where I actually nail this because comedy is a craft. It's an art. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like painting, just like music. Just like how can I master this to be successful? And and while while I'm reflecting, this is what I'm thinking. Actually, thinking about. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, some of the ways that I've seen folks really succeed in that kind of question um, is especially people who have a look, either a really specific look or their comedy is going to be very different than what you expect. Um, for me, the most obvious is like when you have a really, really uh, fat, a lot of times really overweight comedians, their, their, their bit is making, right, look at me. Here's, you know, saying the joke first. I know what you're thinking. You're looking at me and you're thinking blah, blah, blah. Ooh. And it's yeah. so, so I funny, those. right? That, there's, that there might be, and, and it works, you know what I mean? Sometimes self-deprecating humor doesn't work or works in various ways, but, but maybe your opening is, is to really point out how young, how old are you? Uh, I'm 19. Yeah, so you're very young, right? By anybody's standards. And so there's something kind of funny. Maybe, you know, you start your set with making fun of how young you are. Saying, I know I- <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what, that's, is, that's exactly what yeah. I did last time. That's exactly yeah, just, what I did. Know, like, I'm on the way here, like three women tried to nurse me. 
you know, on the way over here. But, you know, and you can really, and that way. Well, now I can't use that joke. But then we'll know, but then we'll know, um, the audience will know um, your writing. Cause like when you were talking about how you have a lot of anxiety, a little bit of stage fright, it sounds like, and like um, that you're writing like, like more than your performance or your persona or like how authentic are you? In my opinion, I think that the if you're a good writer, if you write smart, cool, quick jokes, then the, your your stage persona will will find itself. Like me personally, I feel like I can't do it. Like I feel like I can't do it. Just that I, I'm just not comfortable on stage because I'm regular guy funny. Like mm-hmm. like the guy you work with your coworker, the, the funniest guy, that's me. The guy on the yeah. street, that's me. The guy, the class clown, that's me. Like here, I want to share this with you. This is the paper. I, this is a paper I wrote and that I turned in yesterday and we're going to share this screen right here. Uh, we're just, we're not going to read the whole thing. It's, uh, and this is, this is the paper I turned in uh, a couple days ago. Okay. The question, the question for the, the prompt was um, write about something of, uh, uh, how has gentrification affected, you know, the, 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 where you live, you know, this is from my architecture class, what are the effects of gentrification? And here's what I wrote because, because, uh, uh, I'm me, of course, what I started with is finally the gentrification question has finally come through the curriculum of a class I am taking Cheeto bags are now two twenty nine. Remember the red circles, every bag of che- on every bag of Cheeto snacks, only $2. Now, out of, out of nowhere, they added the little 0.29, 29 cents, thinking nobody would notice. It's not all good in the hood. <laughs> it's great. I turned, that, I turned that in. My professor read that. Good. And I do this all the time. Like, when I took my SATs, I drew cartoons. I drew cartoons on the SAT. Like, like fuck your essay. Like, take this. I wasn't doing the essay. The essay was bullshit to be to to begin with. So uh, I was uh, out of anger. That's how I responded. When I was at work, I, I work at and, and retail now. You know, I left fast. I work in in a sporting goods store, and you know, the daydreaming the daydreaming started to happen again. While I was yeah. like folding clothes, I was you know, and there was, I, I was so deep into a trance that like ten minutes passed by of me just staring into into oblivion and my and my manager said uh, caught me talking to myself by accident i was like uh uh z are you all right and i was like uh oh like oh man yeah i'm sorry i was talking to myself uh just remember i'm I, i'm your friend i was like don't if you ever decide to hurt people i remember i'm your friend it was like don't, and and the first thing that came out of mind i was like don't try to get survivor points with me. I was like, I was like, and that's me like every day, like off the cuff, you know, like I, I talked this with, with, with Brad Upton, the, the last comedian I have on my, my brain is like a wheel that won't stop. It just joke after funny thought after like, and it, it just is like, well, it's a well-oiled machine, like half the time. But when, as soon as I hit stage, it's like, ah, oh, that, that wheel just, you could hit, it just stops, comes to a halt, and I can't, I'm not comfortable. I can't, I can't, the, the thoughts just like, it's just, I just get stuck. And, and that's my stage fright. When you do your sets, when you, I know you said you just did like a couple open mics, you just started a couple months ago, but do you, do you have your jokes planned out, written out, rehearsed, or do you have, did you go up there and just kind of have a loose idea of what you wanted to do and then wing it? I did it. I, I, I used, I, I wrote my stuff down. Like for my first set, I wrote my stuff down. I had my, like on a little book, I had the book or on stage with me. I was like, I did that for the first couple of two. When I, when, then I realized like, even, even when, the, when I was reading off, off of it, it just like disappeared. Like I forgot about it. Uh, I, and I'm on stage. What am I going to do? The last time I went on stage, I decided, you know what, let me, I'm not going to to like, cause what I just told you, I, I'm like every day, I'm every like every day guy funny. And I was like, let me let me see if uh, if I just go on stage with no act planned out, just like with my hands in my pockets, just try to get comfortable. And it was like that that was a that failed as well. But 
you know it's well you know what's hard with open mics too is and I, I don't know you know exactly the deal with the club you're talking about but it sounds like it might be similar is that it is mostly other comics that are watching so you know it's hard to know you can sometimes think like oh I bombed or that joke isn't very funny because nobody laughed but it's not easy to get a room full of comics had an open mic to laugh. Those are some of the roughest rooms. I mean, it's part of the reason why it's a good way to work new material when you're starting out because you're used to kind of literally get used to standing up and talking into a microphone and telling your jokes out loud and watching for the light and all of that. But like, you can't put too much weight on whether or not people laugh because two things, one, the comics who are waiting for their turn aren't really listening, right? They might be like going through their material, they're reading through their notebook, they're kind of figuring out what they're gonna do next. And I sometimes, even with my best friends, because I've been doing comedy for so long, I don't laugh. Sometimes I think something's really funny. It doesn't make me laugh though. I literally will watch a really, really, really funny set and say, funny, oh, that's really funny. A lot of times it makes me laugh. But sometimes you're just, as a comic, you're sort of, you know, looking at it differently and feeling it out differently. But I wouldn't let that discourage you or, or sort of have you figure out whether or not your set worked or whether or not you're good based on how a thing goes at an open mic. Because those are just so, such a different deal than a, an audience, a big friendly audience that came there to see comedy and is ready to laugh, you know? Yeah. And let, let's keep talking about you while, while uh, before we wrap this up. Let, uh... We still got a few minutes left. Um, so you, you say you have a toddler, so you're already starting a, f a family. How is it like balancing? I asked Brad Upton the same thing. How is it balancing the fa you know, your family with your career? Well, I had kids late. Um, I'm 42 and my daughter is two and a half. So, um, and she's my first and only. Um, so I didn't want kids and wasn't married and was not interested in having a family because I'm an actress and a writer. And I just, I never, it just never, I didn't, <laughs> they, some people really have a hard time understanding that there are women who don't, not, aren't sure, like, oh, maybe someday, but are actually like, no, thank you. And I was definitely a no, thank you kind of person. Um, but then I met my now husband and um, what I found was that I didn't like the idea of kids in the abstract, like lowercase italics kids. Do you want kids? I was like, no. But when I thought about having a kid with that guy, <laughs> that me and him get to have a kid together, I was like, oh, well, that actually sounds great. <laughs> like, I think we'd be really great parents. We wouldn't have some stupid fucking kid. We'd have our, our stupid fucking kid, you know? And, um, and then it was an issue of money and career because we both, my husband's a director, um, I'm an actress and a writer. We moved out to LA in an RV, as I said, and you know, lived in that for a few years. And then he got a J-O-B, like proper J-O-B. And we lucked out and we finally had a little money. And so we bought a condo and got pregnant. <laughs> and the idea was, and I was very fortunate to get pregnant. You know, a lot of people have a hard time, especially if they start when they're older, but we were very lucky. We were able to get pregnant right away and had the baby and, you know, we have a little money. So I was not, and by money, I just mean no longer in an RV money. I don't mean like money, money, you know what I mean? Like yeah, security, I for, for security for the first time in our lives. And I was like, this is great because I can have a fucking nanny, you know, like, like part of the reason why this is going to work is because I'll be able to, to, to do, to write during the day and to continue to audition and work at Universal because we can afford childcare and oh my God, what a dream. And then COVID happened. <laughs> so I, I, Universal Studios is closed. I still, I've had some auditions. I mean, I'm a, I'm a SAG, um, you know, I'm a union actor. I've been in, you know, some sitcoms and soap operas and movies and a few things and nobody's heard of me, but I'm a working actor. But there's just nothing happening. I mean, a lot, almost everything shut down. Universal shut down. The clubs aren't running. So without hoping for it or wanting it i've been a full-time 100 percent hands-on stay-at-home mother to my toddler and it's awesome i love it and um i am doing i'm writing a lot of new material <laughs> you know kids provide you with a lot of new material 
I actually uh, wanted to ask you about that. I actually wanted to ask you about that because I saw your your set when uh you had, uh, I saw a set you had when, on YouTube when when you, when you were pregnant. You know. Uh, yeah. How did yeah how did how does uh having a family like affected you as a comedian? Like, did you realize like before you had before before you had a child and and like during the process of having a child, did did your like style or or the the anything about about your, your your work changed it's a it's a good question yes and and no you mentioned earlier that you think of yourself as a just kind of everyday funny person yeah that like funny things are kind of circulating in your head there's always a joke i would describe myself similarly i tend to find see and articulate funny associations and um divergent thoughts and and I'm a history major I have a bachelor's degree in history and so a, early my my the first part of my comedy was often sort of observations about history life current events but then the funny things that I was seeing are always going to be the things that are happening in your life so so naturally there was some material that came out of moving to LA and getting pregnant I mean being pregnant is a lot of things and one of them is funny like your body i mean you remember puberty you're 19 i doubt you're that far away from it your body's funny your body's a crazy funny thing there's a reason why farts are funny to everybody through all cultures it's because your body is a hilarious thing and so i couldn't help but make jokes about that kind of stuff and and similar and then um recently I, I did a, a set at the Laugh Factory here in Hollywood, which is just such a huge stage. I was really stoked to be there. And that set was featured on their Instagram channel a couple of weeks ago. And I had, I forget what the count is. Last time I looked, it was like two, 260,000 views or something, which is hardly a viral hit. But for me, like, you know, it was a, it was a great thing. And, um, and that set was all about my post-pregnancy complications. Uh, you know, I had to have a hysterectomy. It was awful. Um, but, you know, and you, you know this, you're, you're a comedy connoisseur. A lot of times the funniest stuff comes out of your darkest, mo darkest. What, Most definitely. And people can relate to it because I don't know about you, but I, I, some of the time I laugh so hard at funerals and it's not because death is funny. And it's not because the person who's died, who died isn't being remembered and revered. But when people are mourning and when people are sharing a tragedy, there's this weird little magical thing that is that they're just so open to delight there. You know what I mean? Things open up to find the absurd. I don't know. Um, so now my new my my I'm I'm doing comedy now every Wednesday. I'm doing a, I do a Zoom show at a, a comedy club here in L.A. called Flappers Comedy Club. I host a. Uh, you know what you should think about it brother you should you should put your name in I don't actually decide anything I just MC it but it's a weekly comedy contest and um, if you win you kind of move up through the finals and the um, finals you can win two grand which is pretty cool and you can also win paid gigs uh, um, at Flappers down the line so it's a cool job but I'm doing 10 minutes every week and it's been <laughs> through COVID through this last year the first time I did a Zoom show, I just kind of dug up some old material, tried to see if it would even work telling it to a computer during a pandemic. And now it's I have a set that is about being a mom and being stuck in COVID, potty training my daughter. I mean, it the it's almost hard. Like sometimes I'll have a joke, like my pregnancy jokes, that I it's like you kind of retire them. You know, like I might be able to sort of rework it and tell it again, but it was really only a set of jokes I could tell with a giant pregnant belly, you know, actually on stage. So when the circumstances change, the jokes go away too sometimes. It's a little sad. And discussing like the, the you know, well, doing comedy through pregnancy and motherhood and all that, even before that. And this is the last question I want to ask you, like what responsibilities do you feel you have as a, as a female comic? What responsibilities do I have as a female comic? 
Because look, uh, I know that this is misconception. Like, women, like women can't be funny or like whatever. Which I don't think is true because some of my, some of my favorite comedians are are women. Joan Rivers, uh, Wanda Sykes, uh, Sarah Silverman. So, what well, what what do you feel like is your place in, in, in the comedy game as as a, as a female comedian? Well, that's I think that's a fair question. I don't. I wouldn't say I feel a responsibility necessarily and I don't I know and I'm sure you understand this like I don't it would be similar question like how do you how would you feel about being a, a young comedian do you know what I mean like like it's hard I can to answer that actually an you, okay great let me hear I would like to hear that answer well as a young guy because you know the a young guy today will be a 33 35 year old who's been in the game for 10 years that's a young guy, Andrew Schultz. I got saying, yeah. you know, uh, Chris and stuff. That's a young guy these days. Back in the days of like, like Eddie Murphy, twenty-two years old. Dave Chappelle uh, on Def Comedy Jam. The uh, like today, someone like Pete Davidson. So like I, I say, like as a young guy, I want to be as edgy as possible. I don't want to hold back. I want to be. I want to bring comedy back to like what it what what it was, and also show what it could be. That that will be my responsibility. I want to be the nineteen year old screaming, it's like screaming, making like 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 people from from New York to LA talking about, hey, you hear about this crazy kid down in Houston? Just be yeah. be he got kicked out of three clubs already. It was mm -hmm. like that's what I want. That's what I want to be. Like I said, rookie. I, I want to do go through the growing pains. I want. Do you know like the the dick jokes that pie, uh, whatever whatever the fuck uh, like I want to be the next Bill Hicks or I, and I don't want to be the next Bill Hicks I want to be what Bill Hicks want will want me to be or what Bill Hicks th uh, thought someone like me could be that's mm -hmm. that's my responsibility as a young comic I see I see I think that makes a lot of sense um, I. <sighs> I don't know. I think maybe it's just about being being me and being such a cheap answer, but it's true because I did so so this video that that the Laugh Factory posted last week with 265,000 views, there were a lot of comments too, which I didn't read for a long time and then my husband was like it's safe. They're they're not that bad. <laughs> and um and of course there were I don't know here I'll say I'll say tell you this. I don't know what offended me more. The comments that said women aren't funny, because there were a couple of those, or the ones that said, oh my God, there's a funny woman. Like, <laughs> see, see guys, women can be funny. I found both of those comments really equally offensive because they both presume that there is this sort of inability for women to be funny. And I've never understood, for the same thing you said, some of my favorite comedians I've just never but I think that the reason people hesitate to laugh at women and, and it's really easy for women to say that it's men that don't like women comedians but I know plenty of women who have made the same accusation that women aren't funny and I think that it's because for several thousands of years it seems to me that women have been the allowed to cry well, no, they're they're the disciplinarians. They're domestically and in the education system and in the healthcare system, they are the fun killers. That for men and women, it was almost always a woman that said, keep it down, put that down. That's too sharp. You're too loud. You're gonna hurt yourself. Because I said no. Like, yet yeah, men are disciplinarians, but women are like often their roles require them to be the fun killers just they don't they aren't allowed to think it's hilarious because there's a they're running a house and you're going to make a mess and whatever and so we just sort of have it ingrained in us that when a woman comes into the room she's about to kill the party she's whoever this woman is of whatever age she's going to put a coaster under your cup she's going to turn the volume down she's going to tell you that's too sharp or too high or you should quit smoking or whatever and I think that's just because we've divided our roles that way because society has put women in these roles where that was what they had to do. I don't think there's anything inherently female about not wanting to have a good time 
or not finding things funny. Also, we're in danger. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like a really funny moment often ends up with one of us getting hit. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, anyway. So um, I think that maybe if you're talking about responsibility, my job is just to be as funny as possible. And if my and if the the stuff that I find funny and the things that I'm making jokes about fall into the realm of like women's defined roles of motherhood and being pregnant and that kind of stuff, all the better. Right? Yeah, together we'll take down the patriarchy. <laughs> Before we wrap this up, yeah. like anything you all right, it was great having you. Uh, before we wrap this up, anything you need to plug in or or, or say before we wrap uh, this up? Yeah, I should look at the date. I I do have some shows coming up. I have a I'm launching my new website, donbrody.com, uh, b r o d e y. That's gonna go live here in the next couple of weeks, and that will have show updates and you know updated videos and stuff like that. But I am headlining um, on Saturday, March twentieth, at Flappers. Um, at five o'clock, this will bring our whole show, your whole show, full circle, five o'clock Pacific time, which is seven o'clock for you on Saturday, the 20th. That's great. Don Brody, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. <laughs>